animals are the hallmark of one 20th century painter above any other, the German artist Franz Marc. And here in the Lenbach House in Munich hangs one of the finest of them, his tiger, which he painted in 1912 when he was 32. It's not a tiger such as any romantic artist of the 19th century would have painted, not a hunting trophy, nor a beast in a zoo. Very early in my life, Mark wrote, I found man ugly, and animals seemed to me cleaner and more beautiful. Here was a quest for the primitive, for primeval things, and a protest against conventional academic art in Germany, which glorified man, his battles, his swagger, his supremacy over other forms of life. The new art of Germany was for the first time international in outlook. Being a good European means more to me than being a good German, wrote Franz Marc, even though when he wrote it, the First World War had broken out. Artistically, his eyes were turned to Paris, and even further afield to the exotic colours of Gauguin's paintings from the Pacific Islands. Nude with a cat is one of Marx's early pictures. But already, like Gauguin, he's beginning to exaggerate the colours in his subject for emotional effect. Slabs of colour laid around the figure like a bright carpet. The Blue Horse, 1911. Why blue when it's one colour horses never are? Marx has chosen it precisely so that colour shall have a role independent of nature. Blue, red, yellow, black. They must have a life of their own, not simply describe a scene. I try to heighten my feeling for the organic rhythm of all things, he wrote. And in the year he painted the blue horse, he announced, we have to become ascetic, boldly renouncing everything that until now has been dear and indispensable to us as good Central Europeans. So all shapes are crudely simplified, and they're defined by these bold slabs of colour that look as though they've been cut out with scissors and then fitted together. The horse rears up more like a stone sculpture than a living animal and yet the epitome of a horse. And the epitome of a tiger. The same simplification of form and colour. Black, white, golden yellow. Everything centred on that ferocious eye. Is there a more mysterious idea, he wrote, than the conception of how nature is reflected in the eyes of an animal? The tiger is poised, ready to spring. And yet, looking closely at this painting, none of the forms are described in terms of limbs and muscles, but in an almost abstract way, these chunks of red and yellow and blue, like pieces of coloured glass in a medieval window, as if the light were pouring through from behind, between the heavy bars of lead. There's a new kind of romanticism about Mark, the quest for primeval forces. You can almost hear the jungle drums beating. One is no longer concerned, he said, with copying nature, but with destroying it in order to show the mighty laws that surge from behind the beautiful appearance of things. It's a dream world that Mark leads us to, a dream that seems to exclude mankind except that for a young German painter in 1912, the human jungle was pressingly close, and in Mark's tiger, there may be intimations that a terrible war is not far away. Meanwhile, he was fortunate. He had a faithful patron in Bernhard Köhler, a portrait painted by Mark's close friend, August Macker. Köhler was from Berlin, and it was he who gave Mark a degree of financial security. The tiger was one of his purchases, and 20 years ago, his entire collection was donated to this museum in Munich, the Lenbach House. Mark belonged to an association of painters in Munich who labeled themselves the Blue Rider Group. Their spiritual leader was the Russian painter Kandinsky, who, being Kandinsky, insisted on a manifesto, and he made this woodcut for its title page. 
Kandinsky's own paintings were undergoing one of those radical transformations of style which we now see as part of the creation of the modern art movement. He was an inspiring leader, and Mark acknowledged that some of the most memorable experiences of his life were those hours which he spent in conversation with Kandinsky. Today, Mark wrote, we seek behind the veil of appearances the hidden things in nature that seem to us more important than the discoverers of the Impressionists. Mark called this painting Rain. The most obvious debt is Cubism, and of course, to Cezanne. Even Cezanne's colors, those carefully graded greens, blues, and golden yellows. But like Cubist paintings, it has to be deciphered. Two people and a dog are caught in a violent downpour in a wood. Mark has made the force of the rain all but shatter the images, like falling splinters of glass. The Cubist influence is even stronger in the tiger, the way the animal seems to be reconstructed out of flat planes of colour set at angles to each other. Like the Cubist paintings of Picasso and Braque just a year or two earlier, the result is a curious intensifying of the subject. All irrelevant details are removed, both in the description of the tiger and in the background. Cubism is used as a means of heightening realism and of heightening sentiment. Mark painted Deer in the Forest in the same year, 1912. The fragility and gentleness of the young doe is just as heavily stressed as the fierceness of the tiger. The landscape around is again simplified. Elements of tree, rock and sunlight piece together, the plains overlapping, dark over pale creating by very simple means the effect of dense forest, with splashes of light, deep pools of shadow. The resting deer is at first almost invisible in the labyrinth of trees and rock. Mark's aim has been to show not some sweet little Bambi, but a forest creature whose nature blends with nature around. Again, there's this desire to suggest the creature's own world, how wretched, he wrote, our habit of placing animals in a landscape which mirrors our own vision, instead of sinking ourselves in the soul of the animal in order to imagine its perceptions. The year after the tiger, the same cubist labyrinth of a forest becomes a place of danger, of menace. Trees crashing, light pouring in, a crisscross of branches, everything in movement, in chaos. The picture is called the fate of animals. Their environment is being destroyed. The year is 1913, and the painting has been interpreted as a premonition of war. Certainly some cosmic violence is wrecking the peace of the natural world. A doe gazes around for safety. Knowing Mark's later work and sensing his fears of war, we may see his tiger as a symbolic creature. Not a tyrant of the jungle, but standing for the natural order of things. For any animal, human or otherwise, whose right to live is under threat. In one of his last paintings, Franz Marc tried to envisage the apocalypse to come. It's called Tyrol. The heavens are splitting open, and over a world in tumult floats the figure of the Madonna, symbol of hope, but helpless amid this Armageddon. Within months, the First World War broke out, and Mark enlisted. One of the projects he planned was to illustrate the story of the creation. But in 1916, Mark was killed at Verdun. 